Thanks for tuning in. Before we start the show, we have an announcement to make. We got gear for you. Yeah, due to popular demand, we've got some proper nice t-shirts with our famous logo on the front. We've even got two star with caps. We've got the trucker cap and the best-selling uh, lazy slouch adjustable cap. And more importantly, we've got a beer mug, a whiskey glass, and a coffee mug to go. So you can be listening to our podcast no matter what you're doing, whether you're having a cigar at night or you're on your way to work. So you can pick up whatever you like there. Mike, where can they find it? All you got to do is go to freakstrength.com slash shop, freakstrength.com. Click on the shop. Once you click on shop, pictures are going to show up of our merchandise. Click those pictures right there. There you have it. Mike and Brooker show merchandise right there. Scroll right down. Order whatever you can to support the show. Show everyone that you are avid listeners of the Mike and Brooker show. Yeah. Show, you, show yourself as an original disciple of the show. And guys, we just want to thank you once again for the love and support. It means the world to us. But in order for us to keep doing this, we need to keep receiving feedback. So no matter what it is, good, bad, or ugly, we're open to everything. We want to keep delivering the best information possible. So thanks once again for all the love, and we hope to hear from you soon. Thanks, guys. And we're rolling. All right. We got Justin Treadow, my guy. Had him for... Since, since he won a Super Bowl with the Giants, the year after that is when you and I met. You originally started training with DeFranco, though, right? Yes. That was the summer of 2012. Okay. And then from there, actually prior to that, let, let me a little, a little brief, little brief talk about Justin. He's won a state championship with Don Bosco, but was also ranked number one. We were top, we were top 10. We weren't number one. But okay. In my mind, we were number one. If that if that means anything. <laughs> so they were top ten in the country in high school. Then he went over to Florida, won a national championship on that team, and on that team, explain some of the people that you had on that team. Yeah. So I mean, that was probably the best team uh, in college football history. Um, our quarterback was the Tim Tebow years. He had a lot of good players to throw to, from Percy Harvin, Hernandez, you know, all those guys. We had the Pouncey brothers on the line. Then on defense, we had our secondary is like, you know, been, been making in the NFL. I think Joe Hayden's made 100 million bucks. Janoris Jenkins, you know, top tier guy. Major Wright, Ahmad Black, Will Hill. I mean, pretty much the whole team was an all star team. And then, you know, in my opinion, the best coach in the game was Urban Meyer at the time. And uh, to this day, I think we are in the conversation for best team of all time. I, I was like, a low, I was low man on the totem pole. And I, and I played for seven years in the NFL, so that, that, that tells you a little bit about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then from there, Buddy went and won a Super Bowl with the Giants and, <laughs> and, then, and then continued for the rest of your career to nearly get cut every single fucking year that you played in the NFL. For what, seven years? You were like... Yeah. So all seven years were one-year deals. And a one-year deal in the NFL really means a week-by-week -week deal. So you have to perform at all times or, you know, they're going to send you home packing. Yeah. Yeah, think, think about that type of stress. The kind of stress that someone goes through when they don't know necessarily when their next paycheck is going to be. There's, there's zero job security. There's, I, I mean, you, you don't even know whether you should – buy a house, rent a house, rent an apartment, stay with a friend, because if you sign a lease for an apartment, you could be fucked. Yeah. Right? Like, the, the, you don't, uh, then, then you're stuck with the lease for, for over a year. Like, what? what yeah, what the majority of guys with, in my position would either live in, live in a hotel and, you know, you pay it month to month or week to week. Um, or me, when I was in the Giants, I was uh, smart enough to buy a, a three family so that if I did leave, I could just rent it out and not have to worry about the bills. But you did have to think that way. But at the same token, I think it made me and all the guys in my position a lot hungrier and a lot nastier because guys that were drafted fourth round, fifth round, they knew they were going to be there for three years or whatever the case may be. So I knew I had to, you know, crush that guy in order to, in order to win. But that, that word hungry is, is the word that defines you, Justin, man. I mean, I remember, you know, some of the stories you were saying about 
you using different affirmations and that when you were in college? You do I have to give you the prompt into that with using the word of warrior and stuff like that? Let's dive yeah, so straight into this shit, was, man. How yeah, did you so, get this eye in mind? Yeah, so basically, I was always a naturally, um, I guess it'd be like, like an angry, you know, intense, <laughs> intense type person. But you know, that was it played to my strengths for a long time. And then Mike got me into the whole meditation field, which basically when he when he brought it up to me, I laughed at him, and he was like, "That's exactly why you're the kind of guy that needs it." And to me, that that actually made a lot of sense. I'm like, you know, Mike, he talks a lot of bullshit, but this, <laughs> I, but but this one actually made sense. So I'm like, All right, you know, what is meditating or the whole the whole you know? I I had no idea. It's the furthest thing on my mind. I never thought to increase performance or even just your general health or life. I never thought in a million years that it would, you know, do anything. So I started with it. He, he showed me the Wim Hof YouTube video. And I think this is like my second year in Minnesota on the Vikings. And um, I actually got really into it. I was doing the cold tanks and the, the meditation every single day. And I did it for like a good year or so, not even breaking any day. At one point I was meditating in the morning when I got home from practice and then in the evening again. And I would really use, you know, not only um, just like the self body awareness of like trying to like, mostly it was dealing with injuries, right? So like your ankle's killing you. It's like you start breathing and concentrating on like healing that ankle. And like, listen, maybe it's, maybe it's bullshit. Maybe it's not to me. It worked. Um, but I would also try to train my mind to just become a warrior. And, I, and listen, I say that with a sense of real warriors that are over there, like actually getting shot at is another, category of warrior but i would consider myself a warrior like every day i would show up to work i'll put my helmet on and i would go out there with the intent you know with the intention of really trying to leave it all out there and if you got hurt you got hurt but to develop that mindset i think that there's a lot of really talented players that play for a year or two it's because they don't have that that mind component and i think any great player you know, any great player has that, whether they meditate or not. I think you have to have that certain self-confidence and certain belief in yourself to really be able to excel. Mm -hmm. So what was the, the process of you, how you used, because I remember the, the story of the, what was it? The coach also called you out once and said in front of a team meeting, like this guy here, he's a warrior. You remember? Yeah. I mean, yeah, remember so, you telling I'll, me this yeah, story. I'll give you the story. So, so how did it all work? How, yeah, how so, did it all go? So that training camp, um, every, so every year that I played, they always would draft somebody to try to, to take my position. Um, that was just, you know, the nature of the beast, especially, <laughs> as, especially as you get older, they want someone younger that they think would, you know, whether have more upside or just, you know, they want, you know fresh new bodies in there. Um, so that training camp in specific was very challenging. And I was specifically every day meditating just mantra chanting like warrior in my mind right and i always kept it to myself i never brought it out i never said anything to anybody about it and i ended up making the team i, I led the the team in sacks and it was all, all all good stuff and i ended up making the team then you know the defensive line coach in the d-line room you know at the after the day of the final cuts when you're the, the actual team now is there like it was 15 guys in the room and now there's you know just a couple and he, you know, singled me out and was like, you know, you know what? Like, everyone should take a look at this guy. And this guy is a, actually, you know, he is a warrior. He fucking goes out there, does this. And I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting that I was thinking it almost into reality. And I know it sounds a little bit like, you know, out there. But to me, it was pretty, uh, pretty meaningful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think definitely I think more to it than not. I think, therefore, I am. Yeah. Right? Like, the, yeah. that's the power of the narrative. I mean, that, that shit is real. I mean, if you think that you're a fucking pussy, like, if you just think that into existence, you're going to be yeah. a pussy. If you think that you're a fucking warrior and you constantly, your whole day will end up, what the fuck would a warrior do? What, sure. what would a warrior do? Yeah. You know? sure. like that's so, this is so interesting, right? So, this is like the, I think it's called cognitive and clothing, right? If you, they did a, a, a test with children, they gave them a puzzle that was impossible to complete. And kids would, they timed how long it would take kids to sort of give up on it. Then if they gave kids a superhero costume, their time that they was, and I mean, bearing in mind it was impossible to complete, they would stay there way longer and do it. And then 
also what they were recording and the kids didn't know was also what they were saying. And they started saying little things like Batman wouldn't give up and different things like this. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. there's a lot to do with, you know, the how much you can mold your own reality. And, you know, there's different theories with mirror neurons and different stuff like that. But I mean, look, how can your life possibly go wrong trying to be in the NFL if you think you're a fucking warrior? I mean, it's definitely yeah. better than being a worm. Yeah, I mean, another example, I, I, I forget which book I could, I could figure it out and tell you guys, but they basically took like two groups of kids and one of the groups of kids, they were, they were, none of them were, were gifted and talented, but they told the one group they were gifted and talented and all of their test scores were like through the roof yeah. because the narrative in their mind was, hmm, I'm a gifted and talented guy, you know, this is, uh, this is, I'm, I'm going to be good at this. And sure enough, like that, they, they tested way higher than the other group and they were not a gifted and talented. So I, I do think that no matter what it is, whether it's sports or being an acupuncturist and a, you know, trainer and whatever, whatever industry it is, if you think you can be good at it, and don't get me wrong, you have to put the work in. But I think having that thought process allows your body and your mind to push toward putting the work in and achieving the goals. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it definitely starts with your mind. Without that, I've seen the most talented guys in the world. Guys could bench press 500 pounds, run fast. But you know what? If they didn't have it up top, they were, they were gone. They were out. It doesn't matter. It's the most important thing in whatever you're doing. For sure. And you've probably seen the complete opposite too, like bad asses that – you know, physically, they're not, they're not on the same level as any of those guys. And they were able to do yeah. feats way beyond uh, what they should be able to do, right? Mm, so, absolutely. but I mean, there's even stories of, you know, depending on the stress level of what goes on. I mean, the guy that recently broke the deadlift world record, the, I can't remember his name, Mike, you know his name? Thor. You know who I'm on about? That fo yep. yeah, Thor. Yeah. Thor guy, right? He visualizes that the bar is something like it's trapped on these kids or it's a car that's flipped and his children are in there just to give him the sort of like the emotional power to, to be able to deadlift that much. And I mean, there's the mind is for me, it's the, it's the, it's the secret part to it. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, I mean, just really thinking things into existence now, uh, you know, just like Justin was saying, you, you can't be unreasonable with things. Like you can't just, you, you can't just think you're going to fucking fly. Obviously, these are things that you need to be able to achieve. But if you're, on the same, if you're in the same room as someone, there's no reason to think that you can't be on par with them in one way or another. And if you just work your ass off, you could fucking achieve whatever. I mean, I, I genuinely believe that hard work will get you virtually anything you want in, in life. And I, I'd like to think that I'm, I'm almost walking proof of that. I mean, I wasn't incredibly athletic. With, with baseball, right? Like, I'm, I'm not that, I talk to Justin, like, I'm not an insane athlete. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing that stands out about me, but I literally worked myself to becoming a fucking all American just by working hard. Yeah. Right? Like, it's a, by working hard and believing I could fucking do it. And by putting that mindset, like, hey, I'm a motherfucker. Like, that was like my mantra I'm a motherfucker. Like, mm. that's what I am. You remember those old school animal posters? Yeah, dude, I remember those. They were fucking awesome. Right? Like, and it yeah. used to have, like, fucking... Fuck you, you fucking dude. bitch. And all yeah. This. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, dude, that was my personality. That was, yeah. that was, I, and I believe, and dude, like, I'm, I'm just some fucking rich pussy from North <laughs> Jersey, from Bergen County. You know what I mean? Like, what do I know about being tough? But dude, I lived it. I weighed yeah. my food every day. I ate chicken and brown rice every fucking day. I made sure to have my protein. I fucking used to wake up. I set my alarm clock at 4.30 in the morning, chugged a protein shake, went back to fucking sleep. For if, yeah. if we went to parties, ask any of my fucking teammates, I'd bring chicken and brown rice, and then I'd also bring a protein shake because I had to eat every fucking three hours, no matter what. I had to get my calories in. And people ask, why, what are you doing? What, why, what are you training for? And I'd look at them and I'd say, the end of the fucking world. Right? Yeah. Like that's, I'm a motherfucker. That's who I am. This is what motherfuckers do. Right? Dude, sure. that's, and that's Justin. I but mean, you, yeah, yeah, you're not born like that, man. It's no. like how you make a samurai sword is you got to heat it up, you got to beat it, and then you got to cool it down. And then you do the same thing over and over and over again. And it's the same yep. thing with your mind. That's, yeah. you know, that's, I no one has done anything amazing ever did it straight away. You can't. No, I agree. 
I think I think one thing that you know you pointed out, like, oh well, you gotta be realistic, like, oh, I can't Mike, fly. Mute I your microphone. When sorry, when Justin okay. talks, just mute. It's like, yeah, it's like, you know, if uh oh I think I could fly, I can go fly. I think that your mind, you could put the thought in your head, but unless you believe it, then it's useless. You could put the goals, you could write the goals, you could do this, you could do that. But unless you really believe it, like deep down, like I'm sure you believed you can play at that level and be better than most people. If you didn't actually believe it, then you wouldn't have the fight in you to, to take it there. So I think that finding something that you're passionate about that you actually believe you can do and then keeping your mind there is that, that that's part of the whole game of actually like getting your mind into whatever it is you're doing. You have to really believe it. Like you can't have sure. someone else pick it for you. And just cause that guy said, Oh, you have to personally like just deep down, believe you can do it. And then, then you can go after it. Yeah, no, I think you're, you're dead on. I'm not sure if it, sometimes it doesn't start with a really strong belief though. You know what I mean? Like you can, you can get yourself in, but maybe also like, say like with Mike, with the all American, maybe, you know, Mike wouldn't have become the all American, but maybe the motherfucker could become the all American. Do you know what I mean? Like the adoption yeah. of that, you know, it's almost yeah. like an alter ego, man. Like there's so many interesting alter egos that went out there. Like Beyonce had an alter ego. What was the name of that fucking lunatic that played? There's an amazing video. He, he thought he was Wolverine or something in the NFL. Is it Brian Dawkins? Is that his name? Do you know who I'm going yeah, on about? I know, who, I know who Dawkins is, yeah. And he used to come out of the, the tunnel and he would like, you know, he'd be, lo he'd be speaking in tongues and like losing his mind and stuff like that. I don't, I'm pretty sure his name, I think it's Brian Dawkins. Could be wrong. But alter egos, these are also interesting things. And that's also what you do as a kid. Yeah, it, it goes back to, I think, therefore I am, right? No matter, no matter who you want to be in life, you just fucking act. You, you, you know what? There's, there's a story, um, Pete Carroll, the, when, when he first got into the NFL, and he was, I, I heard this story. I forget who I heard it from, but he said, we are a high energy defense. I don't care what happened. We're a high energy team. So, I mean, when you step foot onto this field, when you come into this fucking locker room, you are high energy. I don't care if you're not, you fake it till you make it. You fake it till you fucking make it. Your wife could have left you. You step on, you step into this fucking complex, you're high energy. Someone in your family could die. You're high energy. You lost all your money. I don't care. You come here, you're high energy, no matter what. And that was the year they had, what, the Legion, the Legion of Boom? That was, that, was, that was their team where they were just the most explosive defense in the entire NFL, and they would knock people out. And that's, they just lived it, and they became it, right? So it's, it's fucking awesome. Like, it's what, whatever you want to be, you tell yourself you're that over and over and over and over and over again. And it's, it's no different than like, hey, if, if a guy wants to focus on making money, anything you want to focus on, or even, even something stupid like, oh, I, I, can't, I can't be in a relationship. I can't be in a relationship. Like, I'm not a relationship guy. Well, then people like that just constantly fucking go and cheat on their spouses and they, all the relationships break up. Whereas if you can sit there and you convince yourself like, no, I, this is me. Like, I'm made to be in a relationship. I'm made for this. Like, there you go. And all of a sudden you start doing things that will constitute victory in that area. Yeah, sure. It goes into this beautiful, like ABC cycle. Like, you know, you got your, your feelings, your thoughts and your behavior, and they're all interlinked. So if you start thinking, you know, like, you know, I'm, I'm confident, I'm worthy of this, like I can do this. It invokes certain feelings. Those feelings can influence behavior and a behavior of the type of person of where you want to go, which create, that positive cycle and then before you know it i mean how long does it take for you to you know start behaving in a certain way and then the whole fabric of reality changes because of the way you're deciding to interact with it so yeah i mean know. there's i forget which uh, there's a very famous one of the most viewed ted talks it's like the fake it till you become it and it's like down to like a physiological level mm -hmm. you keep thinking and doing like down to a physiological level like your hormones and everything will change it changes and you sure. actually become it and yeah. Dude, look at a night when you have a nightmare, a nightmare is nothing but images that are going on, right? But those images are creating biochemical um, changes in the brain, which then create 
further changes down the chain. And I mean, if you've ever woken up from a nightmare, your heart's going, or if you've seen someone having a nightmare, as far as the body's concerned, that was real. And the brain don't know the difference between something that's real and imagined. And that's where something like hypnosis is super interesting, you know, or like, you know, and like what is hypnosis and what is it? Like, that's a fine, a hard place to sort of define. But like what you was doing, you were sort of hypnotizing yourself into becoming that, you know, this warrior personality and look at what it made you do. All of a sudden, when that guy tells you that too, that secondary feedback that's coming in, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you think, well, hang on a second, this is coming true. Now I can fucking do anything. You know what I mean? Yeah. I would say that, it does, I was gonna bring that up before. I think that along the way also, there's certain points that, you know, I'm not gonna say they make or break you, but there's an example, like when I was, I was a very good high school player, but everyone, there's a lot of good high school players, right? And then I went to whether the All-American game and this and that. And then once I started kicking some guys' asses there, it's like that next level of confidence and belief, like the more you believe it and like you get put in situations. And I think some people, if they like get, you know, something that doesn't go their way, they can completely like go down the hill as opposed yeah. to like having the ability to kind of fight through those adversities. But I do think that there's certain times, especially in athletic careers, where like there are like, not make or break moments, but when you do, if you do hit them well, you could really develop that more sense of confidence and self of like, I can really do this now. I've done it versus this guy, and now I know I could beat all of these guys. And that's just kind of, it's, but it's all in the mind. It's the same body. It's the same, it's the same everything, right? It's just that mm -hmm. you can turn it up a notch and have that, that deeper belief. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, getting, getting that taste of success. That makes that, that little taste of success is fucking paramount. I remember, I remember, I mean, I, I, growing up, I was in reading classes. Like I'm not the fucking, I was never the smartest kid growing up. I was always good at like good at math and whatever, but never, I never looked at myself as someone that was like super intelligent or more intelligent than the next, the person next to me. So business negotiations, stuff like that. I was never really confident with anything until I started talking to these people and realizing they're not much, they're not much smarter than me. Right. Mm. But all these guys are super successful. Like, fuck, I could do this. Right. Like, and, and even that transition that you're making now into real estate and, and different business shit you're doing now. Right. Jay, like you talk to these yeah. people, they're not much smarter than us. Right. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great point. I think that, just getting your toe in there, dipping your, and instead of just dipping the toe in, you got to jump all the way in. That's, that's one thing I do think that is a leading indicator of if you're going to succeed or not. Like you're talking about when you were bringing eight meals a day, that, that, that's what you do if you really want it. Right. Yeah. So, you know, let's use Mike as another example. Okay. I'm, uh, you know, I want to be you know, the best trainer in the world. So, okay. What's, what's better than having just a gym and I'm, you know, doing this with the weights and the sprints. Okay. Let me learn more about the body and go to acupuncture school for three years. And you don't do that unless you're really trying to go after it and you're focused on something specifically. Like even sure. like with myself, I got done with football, try to figure out what to do. And I got, you know, naturally drawn to real estate because there's a, you know, a, a very dynamic industry, whether it's brokering, buying, selling, there's anything, you know, there's, there's so many avenues you can go. So I do all of them. I do the brokerage. I go to school. I go, I go to NYU. I'm doing development. We're buying properties. I'm buying properties that I'm holding. And you just go all the way in as opposed to just kind of dipping your toe in the water. And, you know, maybe I'll do a few classes and, you know, just kind of coast. I think you're either all in or you're all out. And, you know, to some, some degree and some aspects, it's like negative in the personality. But I do think in terms of succeeding in whether it's sports, business or whatever, you have to just be all in. And yeah. uh, I think that's, you know, paramount to success i agree bro i agree what else do you think is paramount you know what would you say were the key traits for you justin that you know what made you keep going you know like so you I, yeah that's a good question go, go ahead i always tell people like the, the the number one thing is dealing with the failure and the bullshit and the adversity and it sounds cliche but a lot of people when the stuff starts to go south, it, it gets really easy to kind of just like, whether I'm not gonna try as hard or whatever the case may be. Um, I'll give you like one, one good story. So one of, my, one of my favorite teammates that I played with, a guy named Tom Johnson, he was like a journeyman type guy. 
played in like Canada and Europe and arena. He did all the leagues when he was younger. And then he ended up having a phenomenal career, made millions of dollars, was one of the best, like, you know, pass rushing tackles in the NFL, you know, tough, up, tough guy. And I remember this is like, I don't know, maybe it was like the third time in 2015 or 16 where they had cut me and put me to the practice squad, which is like one of the most demoralizing things like for, for a player at that caliber, right? Because you're, you're trying to get paid the big bucks and the only way to get paid the big bucks is to play on Sunday. So when they put you on practice squad, you don't, you don't get to play in the games, right? And I remember one day I was like, you know, and that's like a moment of reverse. And that was like the 10th time it's happened to me. And I was like, you know what? I was like, you know what? Why am I trying so hard in practice? I might as well just save my body for the game and, you know, kind of like, no, like pussy talk. I'm like, yeah, I'll just save my body for the game instead of just, you know, kicking these guys' ass in practice. I'm not, it's not really worth it. And I remember he looked at me and he was like, yeah, I, I don't think so. I think you should just go out there and like whip, whip motherfuckers' ass. And I was like, you know what, Tom? I think you're fucking right. <laughs> and then with like those like messages where it gets tough, even after, even the first three or four times, you were tough enough to bounce back. On that fifth time, if you don't bounce back, then you're, then you're, then you're gone. Right? Like it's that simple. So to have the mentality is so when shit goes wrong, whether it's you're a regular guy and you lose your job with coronavirus going on, you lose your job, you could go put your head in the sand and cry about it and, you know, ask for, for money from the government, or you could, you know, start working your ass up and find a way to get better and learn from it and try to do something about it. I think that those, those bounce backs from adversity are what define, you know, your career in the long run. It's not the good times. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that that can be related to business too, because I know the entrepreneurship is something that's very big nowadays. But most people give up after the first one or two, three things go wrong. But apparently, the actual number is more like, it's the 10th one that goes well, you know. And I mean, you got to just keep on going, man. Like, all, this, all of the people that have actually, you know, done something that they're really proud of and fulfilled with, they just didn't stop. That's it. Yeah. You just don't stop. Like you said, singular point of focus and you just, you're on one horse. You're not trying to sit on four horses with one ass. That ain't going to work. One horse and you go and you, you know, you know where you want to go. And then you just love the whole journey that's going on and all of the peaks and valleys that are going on because it, it's going to go like that. And you want to have, I mean, I always see it like this. If every day you're writing another page into the book of your life and at the end when you don't know when the book's going to end, but when it does, someone that you really love and care for, they're going to read your book. You want the most romantic, beautiful, crazy tale. You know, you want a one where it seems like, oh, there's no way he's going to come back. He can't do it. He's like lost. He's broke. You want that story. You want the most challenging life and you want the most difficulty and you want the things that no one else can handle if you've got the right mindset to deal with it because everything's passing every moment. So, I mean, like the corona thing seemed like a big deal. Now that seems that's quickly disappeared with all the riots that are going on. Now it's riots. Then it's going to be something else. And it's all passing, yep. you know. And at the end of the day, every day that sun comes back up, it's a new day to write another new story on that piece of paper. You know, and unfortunately, most people, if you're writing numbers in the bottom, they'll flip the page, they'll write basically the same story and, and that number straight away. Do you know what I mean? The next number in, rather than just sort of take more, more leadership over their life so yeah yeah see I, I i feel like a total pussy here in that because all i want is to be as routine as possible i don't want any variety my 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 fucking life is literally built on on regiment right like I, I wake up i work out i work and then on this day i do this on this day i do that and you know i have class for this and 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 all these different things so it the variety in my life it, it if you were to read my book, my life story would be, well, Mike woke up today, he had his breakfast, and then he hit 100 balls off the tee, and then he ate food, and then he went to the gym, and then he ate food, and then he went to the cages, and then he ate food, and then he went home and he went to sleep. And, and occasionally yeah. he got into a fist fight. Like, that, that was, but, that was a sense. That's your view. That's your view of it. Because the story that I know, and since I've known you, is bratty kid you know, started working out in probably the most famous gym, really. I mean, or one of the top famous gyms that ever come, was one of the leading figures of it. Had videos that got 
I don't know, probably millions of views, inspired people around the world, you know, then ended up going through a whole journey there, influencing many people's lives that ended up doing things they never thought were capable or healing them from pain. Then starting your own practice. I mean, I know your parents are super proud of you. I know your brother's super proud of you. All the people that love you are super proud of you. And you had a divorce and you kept going and now you're doing acupuncture school. I mean, dude, you got you got a great story too. It's just the way you want you to look may, at yeah. it. You may like routine, but your life is anything but routine. <laughs> yeah, you ain't going to, you know, you're, I mean, bro, you're fucking life. Not many people would be able to live a week of your life. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe, I mean, maybe that's, that's just what it takes to have, have the life that you want to fucking have. Like you want to live that story. You want to live that fairy tale. Maybe, maybe it just is this, maybe it's just the constant routine. I mean, when, when living the life, people, people always used to ask me what, what it was like to be an NFL athlete. Like, what, what are these guys like? And I said, well, they wake up and, and they think like it's this extravagant life from the outside looking in. I said, they wake up, they hope they didn't get cut. <laughs> they, they go to practice, they eat. Like, and then they, they go home, they'll play video games. Some will smoke some fucking weed to try to forget about the pain and forget about the day. And then they'll fucking go to sleep. And then on the weekends, if you're on practice squad, maybe you go out partying, relieve some steam, or maybe you just fucking play video games. So you don't do anything fucking stupid, get yourself in trouble and get hurt. Like, and you just stay the course the entire time. Like, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, you're in the national championship, you're in the Super Bowl. you're doing all these fucking awesome things. And yeah, those are apexes, but it's been all outside looking in. It's an apex. You all right over there, bro? Fucking mosquitoes in here, man. Jesus. <laughs> One just flew in my eye. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's that flat line, flat line, flat line, all of a sudden spike. But then maybe it's a little bit higher, but it's, it's, is it the same routine? Who the fuck knows? I, like I don't, the metaphor of the Chinese bamboo. Yeah. And all of a sudden, after Bang. what? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who knows? I mean, I, I remember asking, and there's a lot of millionaires, a lot of millionaires in this area. Um, and, and I asked one of them, the guy's worth like a hundred million dollars. He says, how long did you work 80 hour weeks for? The guy was like 50 something years old. He goes, 23 years. <laughs> right. Like, and you look at this guy's life, like he has a hell of a life, 80 hour weeks. Like you could look at the highs or his highs higher than anyone else's, but are his lows, are they lower? No, but he's as fucking drone as it gets. Maybe that's the formula to greatness. Just routine in and out. I don't, I, do, I don't I, fucking I do know. Think, I do think routine is definitely key in being as productive as possible. Like mm. pretty much all the great players that I played around, you know, it was Tuesday was the chiropractor, Wednesday was this, Thursday was that. Like the season routine is definitely like crucial to just keeping your body right. Everything, everything I do think once you build a system and you build a routine, it does make you more productive. I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's harder to do when you're in a, in a position like being an NFL player where there's no one watching you or an entrepreneur like Mike and you own your own gym. There's no one that's cutting you a check. So you have to be smart enough and disciplined enough and creative enough to like set these routines and figure out and, and know when to tweak something all right maybe this is working maybe this isn't working and be able to constantly tweak those routines and i think that that is a, a fair point though to being productive i do think that yeah commitment and discipline and every day trying to progress on on this infinite journey looking at it in a, in a big big scale picture for sure so yeah, no, even, even when uh, I kept having major foot issues, every year it was a problem. And so me and Mike sat down, we started thinking about it, and we started doing all the barefoot stuff, foot strengthening, this, that. I, every day I was spending 45 minutes just doing stuff, you know, on my feet barefoot, just creating that into the schedule. And then sure enough, next year, the feet stayed healthy the whole year. So, like, making those adjustments, have, being smart enough and creative to figure it out, and then you know, putting them into a plan and executing that plan on a consistent basis is, you know, that's, that's really kind of how you get to where you want to be. Yeah. I mean, we're just the products of what we continually do. It's like the famous, like Aristotle quote, right? It's like excellence. You know, everyone knows that one. They can run that off the, the, the tip of their tongue. So, you know, it's, 
bro, what um what do you what do you take from that journey through the NFL now into the real estate world, Justin? I would take the the same ex- honestly the exact same principles. I, I really think that those those core beliefs of when you when you face adversity, when you have those issues, being disciplined enough to create your own schedule. Like I every day I have in my calendar exactly what I have to do. Like you have to have that structure. Like in the NFL, they were awesome with when you're in the building, it was like like clockwork. You know, like when you go to training camp, there's like a page this long, it tells you where to be at every single time. And then it's on you to figure that out in the off season and in the lower times. But, you know, bringing that over into like the more entrepreneurial world where it's on you to create your schedule and create your structure and knowing that there are going to be down times, like deals are going to go down and you may lose money here, but you may make a ton there. Like you have to be able to stay even keeled and not get too up on the ups and too down on the downs, which is a lot easier said than done. But mm-hmm. Playing, playing in the NFL, like Mike was, has made a great point, the, the highs are very high, right? So you go from being a 22-year-old kid, you know, growing up a Giants fan, going, winning a Super Bowl and going on the float and this and that to that very next year, you know, getting hurt and missing the whole year and thinking maybe I'm not going to play again. So, like, the highs are super high and the lows are super low so that, if you can manage it and do it long enough, you'll train yourself to kind of stay kind of right in that middle and just keep pushing forward and trying to always think and, you know, keep trying to be creative and do different things. And it, ca- it definitely will carry over to whatever you're doing, whether it's real estate or trying to go be a doctor, whatever the case may be. But sure. I think that that's kind of the, the path that I've, you know, molded from not my playing days. Yeah. One of the, one of the things that, I mean, people always seem, always ask me too, like going a bit back, they always say, oh, so what do all these pro guys do? What are they doing all the time? What's their routines? What's their habits? What are they, they doing when they wake up in the morning? But I think more what's important is what, what you guys don't do. You know, that's really the, the secret to it all. I mean, you don't, you know, like when you're over there in the NFL, you're not trying to go to every new restaurant in town. You're not trying to, you know, network and go to all these parties and live this lavish lifestyle if you're on the journey of, I mean, especially you, Justin, I mean, fighting for your spot every year. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's where the real discipline comes in. Yeah, I mean, I did, you know, even in college, I think I would, during the season, go out drinking and partying, maybe like after like one or two or three of the biggest games of the year. Like short of that, you know, I really wasn't doing anything. I was going to sleep. I was taking care of myself. And... You know, it's funny. I actually just started watching the uh, the new Michael Jordan documentary, and it shows him like as a young rookie. And he made the one story about how all the guys were in the room. They had you know the girls on this side, they had the coke on this side, the weed on that side, the drinking on that side. And he's like, I'm gonna just go home and take my ass to bed and go start you know go shoot in the court tomorrow morning. And I think that don't get me wrong. There's there's certain fun that you're gonna have along the way. You know, whether it's after big games or in the off season, whatever the case may be. But I do think that that discipline, if you want to be great, at least for me, maybe some guys can get away with it. But I think that the majority of the guys that are great have that mentality. Mm-hmm. So what do you, what do you think, what did you do in the pros that you didn't do in college? Because I know, so I know in high school, just because I know you, uh, Justin didn't play football his freshman year because he got injured. Mm -hmm. And then one of the coaches said, they're like, oh, be the film guy. Tell that story. Great story. Great story. So my my first year in high school, um, I had the ankle issue. I I dealt with foot and ankle issues my my whole career. Um, But anyway, that that freshman year, I I was trying to go out there, and it it hurt so much I literally couldn't even, like, I couldn't run or anything. But I kept trying, kept trying, kept trying. Eventually, I went to the doctor. He's like, yeah, you got you to gotta shut it down for a year. And to me, I was like the most disappointing thing ever. I was supposed to be this, you know, good new player at, at, the, at the, you know, very prestigious high school. The year I got there, that year, they were the second-ranked team in the country. They were, like, really, really good. Um, so I go in there, and I can't play. And one of the coaches, who I'm actually still really good friends with, um, He's like, oh, yeah, we still want you to be around the team, be part of the team. He's like, you know, but I need you to go up into the bleachers and film practice. So, you know, I'm going up there, I'm filming the practice. And like after like the second or third day, I was like, I can't, I'm not, I'm not doing this fucking shit anymore. 
I'm not, I'm not a fucking camera boy, you know? And it was just like, cause it was like watching these guys play was just irritating me. And then I had to like be in the stand. It was, it was like, you know, pretty tough mentally. So eventually I had to stop doing it. And the coach comes up to me and like, Hey, you know, what do you, you know, we need you to do it. And I'm like, coach, with all due respect, like, I'm, I'm just not a, I'm not, I'm not going to be the camera bitch of the team. Like it's just that simple. And he was like, you know what? That's bullshit. You know, but, you know, but he motherfucked me and you know, going into that next year, like they were hard on me, but I was ready. I was ready for the challenge, you know, and then, uh, ended up having a pretty good career. And I still, to this day, have an amazing relationship with all of those coaches. They were tough. They were tough fucking guys though. They were not, they were not, they were not messing around. Um, but yeah, good story. So what do you, what do you, what did you do differently in college that you did? Well, first off, Don Bosco, for, for those of you that don't know, the old school Don Bosco, they beat the shit out of their players. They annihilated their players and their players genuinely thought that they were invincible. Like they, they I mean, Toll is an animal. I had, I had the pleasure, the privilege of coaching with him for a year and a half. And I mean, this, this guy is just, he's, describe him, Jay. To tell them, tell them about Coach Toll. I mean, he's an old school guy that was like a fullback in the 80s, golden gloves boxer, would go, go mix it up in like the worst neighborhoods that you could think of and go in there and like box with guys. And was just like, you know, I don't, I don't know if this is a true story. I never heard this. I never, I wasn't there to quote it, but his son was like one of the, probably the best high school player I've ever seen play. And when he was younger, um, I guess he like hurt his ribs in a game or something. And this is just a story. So, I mean, don't quote me on it. But this will give you an idea of how Toll was. And I guess he, like, broke his ribs in, like, the first half of the game. And at halftime, he was thinking about not playing and this and that. And Coach Toll was like, basically, hey, are you going to go do the dishes with your mommy or are you going to come out there and play? And they, <laughs> and, they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they taped his ass up and he went out there and played. And, you know, but that's the kind of guy, like, but you know what? He cared for his players more than an, like, anybody. When he had his uh, little, like, reunion thing we did a couple months ago or a year ago, he had guys from, like, the 90s, like, people that, that were, like, grown, like, 40s and, like, they were older guys. They, they came out of the woodworks to come see him and support him because he would go out of his way and, you know, do anything for his players. So that prepared me a lot for Florida because when I went down to Florida, I, I, we already kind of talked about how talented the team was, but my ass was always in the top two or three on the effort board in the weight room just because this shit was easy to me coming from, uh, coming from uh, the Bosco days. It was, uh, these guys were all dying. And I was like, this is actually a cakewalk compared to the shit they used to do to us. <laughs> yeah, they, so they, they used to, I mean, Bosco, Bosco would annihilate guys. And <clears throat> Florida was known to actually have some of the hardest workouts in the SEC, like those, those guys, Urban Meyer is a maniac. Like these guys would absolutely demolish guys. And Justin said, I remember Justin telling me that those workouts really weren't anything crazy compared to the Bosco workouts. No, it was easier. It was easier. <laughs> what was some of the shit they made you do at Bosco? Give us, a, um, uh, give us an example. So we would start the day with a drill called goal line tackle where, which is basically me and it was always someone your size. So like, you know, me and another 230 pounder and they line us up five yards apart. One guy has the ball, one guy is on the goal line and he either gets in or doesn't. And it's just like, you know, straight head on. So that was like the first thing you did right after you got done, like, you know, touching your toes for about 15 seconds. <laughs> and and uh, the loser would always, you know, that's out of three, loser does push ups or uh, up downs rather. Then we would get done with that. We would go to individual uh, for offense which was more of the same. We had a shoot that was about five feet high. You get under the shoot, there's a board, there's a guy on one end, a guy on the other end, and you just walk in, go right down, right down the pipe again. You know, you do that a couple of times, and if you keep losing, they'll put you in there more. And then we got to the next drill for defense. It was a drill called butt and swim, where every five yards, there'd be a, a person, about 30, 30, 40 yards, and you run down the line, and you headbutt the guy, swim him, headbutt the guy, swim him, and you keep doing it uh, all the way down the line. And then you got the team drills. So, so that was how we started the, the practice every day. But you know what? I was really, you know, I wasn't that strong or that physical 
I mean, you, you know, you're a 14 year old kid or 13 year old, whatever it is. And after like a year or so of doing that, like you, you, you become a lot better at football. Like it's that simple. You learn how to like strike people and how to use your leverage. Like it was definitely, you know, people probably don't do it anymore, you know, with all the concussion stuff. But I do think it genuinely made me like a lot, a lot better at football. Like it really did. Oh, my, my, my face is hurting. Tell, tell, what, what was the one story like leaving, Sa or the one, one, uh, the one drill leaving Saigon or oh, get out of get, Saigon? Get, yeah, get out of Saigon. Saigon, what a drill. So it was a, you know, a big circle. Everyone's kind of around. And you had, it was either three or four blockers and a ball carrier and one defender. And your job was to get to the ball carrier, just, just tag them. And it was get out of Saigon. So the only way out was to touch the ball carrier. If you didn't touch them, you, you were basically just going to get finished by these other four guys. So you go in there. If you, if, and if you didn't swim them clean the first, like, 20 seconds, you were too tired and you were going to end up just getting buried. And every time you try to get up, someone would just fucking crush you and put you down. <laughs> but, yeah, amazing <laughs> drill. Great Vietnam <laughs> reference. Get out of Saigon. <laughs> so, oh, wow. So Tol, Tol was telling a story one time. And he was like, yeah, we, we, we hit a couple of these guys pretty good. I'd, I'd, I'd be in a lot of trouble if we did that in, in today. <laughs> <laughs> Which one was told from when, I was, when we were going to uh, Bergen Catholic? Because wasn't he there? Yeah, he was the older dude that was limping. He was oh, the guy with the limp. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He's got, he had bilateral knee replacements simultaneously. <laughs> like the guys, he don't give a shit. He's, he's a motherfucker. I, I, lo I love him. I would have loved playing for the guy. Um, so, so what were the things that you took from that, that, that you did in Florida that you didn't do at Bosco? Like that, that got you to that next level? Well, I think that the biggest difference was the talent level that you played with every day was so, like, was so much greater, right? Like by the time I was getting done in high school, I was, you know, if you're an All-American, you're gonna, you better be better than everyone that's around you, right? So when I got to Florida, every single one of those guys was as good or better than me. So, you know, just working hard and all that stuff, like it, it was not gonna cut it. Like you had to really like refine your, and I had a very good defensive line coach my, uh, when I first got there, very you know, strong technique coach. And you had to learn how to play football now, whereas, you could do whatever you wanted when the guy across from you is half as talented in high school. Then you get to this next level, it became a lot more, and, I, and, and that's a trend that continued all the way through, like, to, you know, all the way to the, to the NFL, was learning how to actually play the game, getting in your stance properly, getting your hands properly. And we were very well coached at Bosco, don't get me wrong, but that next level, you know, in order to succeed, I mean, the, the amount of guys that are just so much better than everyone else at that level gets smaller. There's some, you know, there's some guys that even in college, they don't have to have a shred of technique and they're going to be better than everyone, but that's a very small percentage. Um, so actually learning the game and learning the technique and being, I think more, the, the more mental components started to take, take, uh, take place there. Okay. Now take, I already know the answer to this, but take that one step further. What was the difference between getting into the next level in the NF uh, from, from college to the NFL and then not just getting on the team, staying on every team that you were on? Um, what, what was 100% in my opinion is because at that point, if you're, if you're making it to the NFL and you feel like you can compete with guys, you're already strong enough, you're already tough enough, you're already smart enough, or you won't, you won't be there, or in a year or two, you definitely won't be there. But being smart enough to train properly and keep your body healthy and doing things that, you know, I was, I was very resistant to in the beginning, things that are not traditional. Like, uh, you know, I was always just lift weights and do as many sprints as you can and, and, and call it a day. But b to remain healthy and really train and do all the things that you don't really want to do that aren't that fun, um, at that point, Having, having that in your toolbox to be able to stay healthy is the only way you can continue to play. Like it, after a certain point, like you have to just focus on keeping your body right or you're done. And that, and that, that becomes the full-time job. Playing football is the easy part after a while. 
Uh, you know how to you know how to play. You're always getting better, no no doubt about it. But playing football is the fun and the easy part. It's the other ninety percent of the time that you're trying to get yourself to that ten percent. And you can take it even one step further to where you're practicing trying to stay healthy for that one percent of actually playing in the game. It just gets more and more compressed to where you're doing everything you can for that one day a week, 17 weeks out of the year, or 16 weeks out of the year. So, <clears throat> essentially, refining your craft and finding the minuscule, the, the small details, the, the little tweaks is really what, what kind of helped you stay that much stay in the game that much longer it was it yeah. was the small things not the not the big things no the big the big things listen if i could bench press 350 pounds or if i could bench press 400 pounds it wasn't gonna get me three more sacks that year right but if i kept my body healthier if i got a little bit faster if i learned how to use my hands a little bit better that could take me to the next level it was like the small the small things a bunch of bunch of small stuff that leads to like the big picture of how you are as an actual player again bringing in the the mental component right like in high school even in college i i genuinely didn't even think about anything like i was just going out there and playing and i didn't take care of my body like it didn't matter right i was just lifting working hard going out there playing like then it became every little thing you could if you if you learn one thing like my, i had a great coach in minnesota he taught me one thing that enabled me to go out in the preseason and sack the quarterback, you know, more than other guys and allowed me to make the team. But that, if I didn't, you know, pay attention or if I didn't learn that one little minute technique detail, then the career would have ended long before it did. So if you're, if you're not constantly going after those things, then, you know, you're just not going to, you know, reach your full potential. I mean, you still may have a great career, but I mean, you look around at, you know, other guys from this gym, like, Look at um, you know the McCordy brothers. Those guys have been playing forever at a very high level, and they're still coming to Mike. They're not, you know, they're still doing these things to try to always improve, because otherwise you won't ever be your full potential. And at the end of the day, that's all you can really control. And that's one thing. Back to your question about what did you learn from the NFL that you're taking over to the business world? And this is life. This is not just you know football business or whatever. It's you can control what you can control. If you spend any time thinking about shit that you can't control and wasting energy and, you know, getting, you know, getting yourself anxious about it, you're going to detract from your performance, period, end of story. If you focus on what you can control and put all of your eggs in that basket, you're going to have a hell of a lot more success than vice versa. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, it seems like, from that story that you're saying there, you have this period of really working really, really, really hard. And that sort of work ethic never stops, but you're just, you're trying to evolve and progress more based on just being wiser, I guess. You know what I mean? And just constantly learning new information and probably yeah. more from the, the big picture, like a, from a macro level than like what you said, these little micro things like trying to add, you know, 20 kilos to a, to a bench press or something like that. So w with that said, and this you know, goes back to, you know, we were joking and laughing about, you know, the coach told days and all that. But I do think that from like your youth till that middle of college, that's where you're, you're building that foundation, right? Yeah. So you, you could look at it from a strength perspective, right? It's like, yeah, maybe when you're 25 years old and you're already in the NFL, you don't really need to, you know, squat, you know, 500 pounds anymore. But I do think that, you know, when you're at that, those younger ages, instilling like the work ethic of, you know, being able to run your balls into the ground and being able to go into the weight room and lift as heavy as you can, like doing all those things when you're younger, it, it, maybe it's not the, you know, the most scientific way of doing it, but I do think it creates like a foundation of mental toughness and just overall strength. And you, you get to a certain point where you have that and then it becomes those little micro things. But I do think that when you're younger, putting in that work, whether it's, the mental capacity of being able to get screamed at and motherfucked and, you know, conditioned really, really hard, get, you know, getting thrown in the fire, getting into fights and all these things, it does take you to a certain level that enables you 
to kind of get to that point where you're really honing in on the small stuff. But I think you have to have a very strong foundation to kind of reach that level. Sure. And I, I, for me, the, the right word is stress resilience. Like you're learning the foundations of how to cope under high amounts of stress. I mean, for sure, it's probably not the most scientific way if we look at it now, but it doesn't have to be. If you're able to, to sort of deal with constant adversity and constant challenge, then, you know, the accumulated effects of that, then you can transition that and transfer it into, you know, what, what you find at that current moment, like you said. But I mean, there's no doubt that even as you progress through, you're still working hard. You're just working smarter than you was before. Correct. That's, Correct. you know, that, that work ethic never stops. And I'm sure anyway, you're not going to become a super successful real estate guy by working, you know, one hour a day. Yeah. Or at least not right now, maybe in 30 years, you know, when things are set up properly, but even still, you might not, you might not even really want to do that. That might not fulfill you that much. You know what I mean? Exactly. You're exactly right. I had heard a story from a Don Bosco alum, a football alum, and they, they had told me that their workouts were so tough that guys would just, it, everyone would puke almost every single day. Like that was, that was almost like the norm. But guys, guys were puking so frequently, they'd just stop and they'd stop the runs. And the coach looked at him and he said, it was, I think it was one of the Campanellis said, you know, you could puke and run at the same time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point is that type of mentality, right? To know how far you can actually go. It's like David Goggins is talking about, right? Like the guy ran 60 miles and then his feet were bleeding and he shit himself and pissed himself and he was like pissing blood. And he said, all right, 40 more miles to go to qualify. Right. It was, it was something outrageous like that. Right. So, and then he did it and he qualified in time and he did it on myoplex and like crackers or some shit like that. That was, he didn't even bring water. That's all the fucking guy had. So to know your limits, that, to know that in the mental toughness aspect, the stress resilience, right. To know how much stress you can actually take and then keep building yourself up to that point. And eventually the resilience grows and the resilience grows and the resilience grows. And that's something that can be developed before puberty, during puberty, after puberty. Yeah. You can develop these things mm -hmm. all life. But if you develop this stuff when you're young, now I'm not saying kick the shit out of kids and, you know, do all this stuff. Like, I don't necessarily think this is a great idea, but you look at, <laughs> you look at all these guys, I mean... There's a lot of super, super successful people that I personally know that came out of these programs that know what hard work is because of how hard they were pushed. I mean, I talk to people all the time and people are like, oh yeah, I work out. I work out. I said, oh, cool. How often do you work out? So I work out, you know, a couple times a week. It's like, all right, you don't train. Like you might work out, you go to the gym, you have fun, but like you don't work hard. Like when people are like, oh, I, I work my ass off. Like, no, you don't. Like that's not working your ass off. You go to the gym and you, you know, you recreate, you know, you do this for recreational activity or you do this for fun, but you're not working hard, right? There's a difference between working out and working hard, doing something and doing it to a high, a high uh, effort, right? Like, and you actually learn at these schools what a real fucking effort is supposed to be, right? Yeah. Does, that, does, does that make sense? Yeah, I think a, a simple way of putting it is, uh, this is why I love high school football. I think that, you know, all the talks of how unsafe football is, and, and I get it. There's probably some you know, scientific evidence that shows it, but I do think that an example of how my high school was, it takes a boy and tries to turn him into like a man. And like the way to get to there, you know, I was, I was fortunate. I had great parents and I would have got there regardless, but I do think that sports in specific are a great outlet for guys that maybe they don't have, you know, good role models at home or whatever the case may be. And a great coach that can put you through these hard, you know, hard tasks and, you know, develop you and kind of just push you into being a man as opposed to, you know, a 14, 13 year old kid. So that's, I mean, that's my personal view because I mean, I'm biased. I, I went through it myself, but that's, that's kind of how I see it. It's like a, a ceremony. And, you know, if you look at different tribes from around the world and certainly, you know, back in the past, young boys had to do something to become men. 
what a great way of doing it in a Catholic school and smashing, you know, heads with each other every day, you know, and especially when you've got this idea of this, this dream that, you know, you know, other people have got there and, you know, could you, could you do it? You know, and just that question, am I, am, could I do it? Am I able to do it? You know, the question is much better than the answer of, you know, oh, I, I, there's no chance I'm able to do this. You know what I mean? And then you just build in your self-esteem day in, day out, doing stuff where your mind's like, I can't do it no more. And then you're able to do it. And then with time, you just, you know, you, you create this iron mind. Justin, I wanted to ask you anyway, one of the things I wanted to go in is your dad's, he's a, he's a hard old bastard, isn't he? And he, if I remember correctly, he still trains every day. He looks in top shape. Yeah. How much, yeah. How much has, has he been an influence on your life? And, you know, what did you learn from him? Yeah, I think that, you know, growing up, watching how he was putting the work in, coming home late, going to, going to the gym at 8 o'clock at night, getting home at 9, sitting, eating his, uh, you know, in front of the TV for a couple of minutes, saying hello to us and going to bed and doing it all over again. And just seeing the discipline and the strength to continue to do that. And, and obviously, not obviously, but if you don't know, he had massive success. So... You know, he was from like a immigrant family and didn't have much opportunity. So when you see when you see things like that, it definitely motivates you to be like, wow, well, if he did all that with that upbringing, then, you know, I better do better than that. Or it's almost like, you know, you're kind of letting everyone down. And that's kind of the, the one of the big driving you know factors for me um, always in the back of my mind was, you know, this is kind of like in my blood to be able to do this. Yeah. 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 You're proud of your, of your last name. Exactly. And you know what? Yeah. That was another bad to coach toll. One of his most simple sayings was, you know, make your mom and dad proud. Look at the, you know, the name on your back, like go out there and make your mom and dad proud of you. And that's, that's a pretty, you know, if you really think of it hard, like it's a pretty deep statement. It's like you go out there and you act like a pussy, like you're, that's, that's, you know, you're representing your family like that. So. Oh, yeah. Take it for what it is. So Justin's dad is is pretty close to my idol, right? <laughs> this guy, this guy lives the life that I want to live. He, I mean, talk about meticulous, diligent. One of his fav, one of my favorite things that I've heard him say was, I think Justin, Justin's one of his friends was working out with him, and was working out with his dad, and. <laughs> His dad says, every single day, you know how I lift this weight? I think I, I lift it as if my children's lives depend on it. <laughs> <laughs> but but this, is, this is the mentality that you have. Everything you fucking do depends on everything that you do, right? Like it, it, your whole life depends on this right here, right now. And I think that's how, like that type of stress and that type of almost anxiety that people put themselves through gets them through this bullshit and gets them on the other side. Does that mean, right? Am, am I speaking gibberish? No, 100%. Uh, 100%. I mean, there's this whole idea that life shouldn't be stressful and this whole idea that, you know, and I'm not saying that clinical cases of anxiety, we're not talking about that. We're keeping it just regular anxiety. I mean, that's, that's motivated. That's getting your ass going. I mean, what's wrong with that? You know, really. And I'm sure like, okay, you know, and definitely not everybody, but a majority of people when they, they you know, they're depressed and they say, oh, you know, um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm depressed and I'm fat or I'm depressed and, I, I, and, and that means I'm broke. And most of the time it's usually just flipped around the other way, you know? you're out of shape, you're unhealthy, you got nothing going for you, then of course that creates this feeling of, you know, anxiety or depression. It's, you flip it around, you know what I mean? So, you know, that's the way that I see it. And not with everybody, of course, you know, you've got clinical cases of, of, of different mental disorders, but for the vast majority of people, I mean, you know, the life that they're living, I feel like, you know, they're doing what they want to do most of the time because you don't actually have to do anything. And if you were really desperate, you could always stop things if you really, yeah. really wanted to. I think it's, I think it's somewhat of an art to be able to 
take yourself to that point where you know when it's time to go hop in the sauna and do it and hop in the cold tank, right? It's like life in general, if you're going to want to do anything, whether you want to be a lawyer, a doctor, a business guy, a teacher, whatever it is, there's always going to be stress and there's always going to be things that you have to kind of get through in order to, to do well in it. It's a matter of kind of knowing when you have to take a small break to get a massage or take a, you know, to whatever, whatever that is. And that's, that's, I think that's a learned skill. You know, it took me a long time to be able to manage that type of stress as opposed to getting angry and going out and doing the wrong things. It's like, even like I'll use today as an example, you know, I've been working really hard on like a couple of things and I have a baby, I have, you know, all these things going on. And I'm like, you know what? It's a good idea during the week. I'm going to come see Mike. We're going to work out. We're going to hit the sauna, do the cold tub, sit down, bullshit. And, you know, it's okay to do that here and there along the way. It will make you, I feel like, a little bit more likely to succeed than just completely running yourself into the ground. But there is a, there is a fine line between doing it and being lazy. Like, you have to definitely work to a point where you know, you know, your routine and when you can kind of take those breaks. I mean, mm -hmm. I haven't seen Mike in like about a year now. He's been so busy. But he does know how to Crazy. take care of himself and do his things. And, you know, it's just, that's just the nature of the beast, though. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if, if we're honest, I don't think that you can, you'd probably class this day as lazy when you go to bed tonight. You're probably going to go home feeling, you know, energized, excited, you know, inspired for, for everything else of what you're doing. It's definitely aligning with your values. Talking about, you know, your, your new into fatherhood, what are you, I mean, how are you managing with your, with your boy right now? Like, what are you, how's it going? Like, what sort of philosophy are you trying to raise yeah. him with? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that, you know, the first thing I'm going to say, not only to, you know, cover my own ass, but my wife is the best, you know, <laughs> she, she, she does an amazing job with him and the amount of time that she puts into him compared to like, listen, I, I, I make time every day. And especially now, you know, with all the stuff, everything, everything's shut down. You can't, you can't do as much. It's been somewhat of a blessing in disguise to be able to really enjoy his, you know, he's one and a half years old for reference. So from like, you know, 13, 14 months to now, I've gotten a lot more time. Um, but I, I do think that discipline and I'm trying to have him eat all the right foods and stay healthy and just, you know, you can never mold somebody exactly they're always going to be who they are you know mm. i think that my philosophy going into this and i'm learning every day I'm a, I'm a new i'm a new parent is i want to just give the opportunity and the structure and the discipline to let him become who he is in the best avenue possible and that's just kind of how i'm approaching it i like it i like it i like it yeah just just support just support the kid in developing how he needs to develop Right? Uh, yeah. Who the fuck knows? Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll try on this one, on number two. We'll try something else and see which one fucking worked. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that no matter what, though, as long as you're super involved and you love the guy and, you know, you're going to do whatever you can for him and you have, you know, the discipline in yourself to give him structure and give them discipline as, as young kids. That was one thing that I... I think helped me and you know other people that I know that are successful people is if you have that discipline from a younger age just it just definitely gives you a better chance of being able to go further because without that discipline you just end up you can end up you know in all different types of avenues that you don't want to go down mm. so what are you going to instill in him it, 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 as as he gets older like what what, what type of mentality are you gonna are you gonna try to instill in him right like yeah. personality wise whatever yeah i think that the most important thing that i want to instill in him is when you want to do something to do it right and then if you fail at it you keep on doing it like most people that succeed it's not that they didn't fail it's that they failed and kept going failed and kept going failed and kept going and that's that's a very difficult thing to develop. And I think that, you know, as, as a leader, whether it's a leader of a team, a father of a son, whatever the case may be, I've never been the most vocal, vocal type guy that, you know, does a lot of talking. I think that it's all by, by example. I think that how you conduct your own life and how you, 
you know, present yourself is the, the strongest thing that you could do. Yeah. Yeah. I like that, Justin. I mean, you know, I think you're definitely right in terms of, you know, time and, 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 and being with the kid, you know, and, and trying to sort of encourage it to become who it wants to become. But I think it's also important that you continue to lead your life, you be fulfilled, you be happy so that the kid only sees that as, as reference. You know what I mean? Cause you know, you being in the best state, excited for life, you know, happy, a positive influence to be around. You good? Oh yeah. Sorry. The internet was going in and out. All right. Easy. So yeah, no, that was all I wanted to say, you know, focusing on still leading your own life. You, I mean, you've still got a lot that you probably want to achieve. Of course. Yeah, and start of a, of a new career from zero. So that's oh, fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the cool part, man. Like, you get to take everything that you learn now and bring it right into another. I mean, you were seven years in the NFL, like, or eight, eight years in the NFL, whatever the fuck it was. You get to take all that knowledge from that time and bring it and apply it to a completely different field and you're going to fucking kill it because you already have the work ethic and you're not a total idiot. Like it's, it's <laughs> you know, like you're, you're going to, yeah. Like, I, Hey, we all have our fucking moments, but I mean, it's, it's going to be awesome. Like, so it's, I'm, I'm fucking stoked and it's nothing but success for guys like you because you know what it takes to be good and you just continue to, Hey, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. It's not going to be overnight, but eventually you're going to fucking climb the highest fucking mountain. It's fucking sweet. Yeah. No, and listen, for somebody like that's transitioning out of a career, and it's, it's definitely unique for athletes because you do one thing. You say, oh, you played in the NFL for seven years, but you've been playing games since you were seven, right? So it's like you go all those years doing one thing, and then you try to find out what to do next and you're 30 years old and you know in your world you were old but in the regular world you're very young and you know in terms of guys that work in regular like a finance degree for example like anyway to have that mindset and put it forward it's not it's not easy i mean i'll speak openly like i definitely struggled for the first you know couple of months i was definitely not not depressed but just trying to figure it out and it's, it's not an easy thing and guys always go through it and a lot of guys end up do getting, you know, depressed and this and that. But I think that going back to what we were, what we were talking about, you know, this, this past hour is if you can apply those principles to whatever industry it may be, you know, find a mentor that's done it before you and try to jump on and learn from them. And then you're going to take it and you're going to take what he's teaching you and you're going to start moving forward with it. And I think that reaching out to people and trying to see people that are already great it's just like when you were playing, like when I got into the Giants, I saw Justin Tuck and OCU Manure. I'm like, man, these guys are really good players. How do I be like them? Let me watch what they do. How do they prepare? How do they watch film? How do they go into the training room and take care of their bodies? I want to learn. And that's exactly what I'm trying to apply to the professional world. And I think that that's a great first step for anyone that's getting out of a profession, whether it's it doesn't have to be sports. You could just say you got fired and you were an engineer and now you want to go into finance or whatever the case may be. But finding someone that, they don't even have to mentor you, but finding someone that you know is very good and trying to learn from them. And then you'll put your own spins on it naturally. But I think that that's like a really strong technique to use if you're in a position of, you know, transition like that. There you go. It sounds, it sounds like a fucking recipe to me. Recipe for success there, Ben. Got, I got nothing to add on that one. Let's, let's fucking, let's, Brooker, you got anything else? Nah, man, I'm, I think that was great. Hell yeah, let's, let's fucking I end can't, on that. I can't believe that you ain't seen Justin in a fucking year. Oh, I mean, that, you're seeing Justin every day. I've, I've seen him, but uh, maybe like three or four times. Yeah, I've, I mean, since, dude, since I started school, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't hung out with anyone. It's been, it's been two years since I've, really hung out with anyone over uh, it, the first drink that i fucking had in two years was watching the uh the last dance i we talked about it with uh mccordy that sure. was the first that was the first drink that i had in two years or so you know like it's it's just my life it's just a, it's like i said you you read you read my book it's gonna be fucking boring <laughs> <laughs>
Debatable. <laughs> I bet you. I bet the people that you you care about most, or when they read it, they'll be proud of it. And that's that's what you want to be doing. It's like what Justin was saying. You know, you're going out there to make make his parents proud. Who he holds in a very high high light. So, cool man, Justin. Thank you so much for your time, bro. Lovely yeah, to see you. Good to yeah, see fuck you. yeah. This is great. And I, I, we'll, we'll keep everyone posted on how he continues to fucking crush life because we're going to be doing this podcast for a few years. Yep. Awesome. All right, man. Thank you. Happy days. Thanks, you, brother. Cheers, man.